He is worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. Worthy to be praised. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, who saved us and calls us with a holy calling. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and continue to be in this place and move among us. Come, come and rest particularly in a special way upon those we've just commissioned and those who we are about to ordain. Come, Holy Spirit, in ways that they might have a new experience of your presence with them. And don't just allow your spirit to rest on them. Oh, no, Lord. All of us seek that spirit which empowers us to be the people that you designed and created us to be. So come, rest on each one of us this day that we might know you again, that we might once again turn our lives over to you and say, yes, Lord. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There are a number of different angles from which we can view the parable of the sower and the seed. In this story of new beginnings, is it the sower or the seed that we need to examine here? We have a choice. We can examine the sower and the seeds, or we can take a look at the different types of soil. If we were to focus on the different types of soil, we might begin to ask ourselves some questions. Questions like, what kind of soil am I? Am I rocky ground? Do I need to smooth out some rough places in my life? What are the weeds in my soul? Hmm. What chokes the life out of me? Am I a shallow person? Do I get all worked up and enthusiastic only to give up when the excitement of the new is gone or things get rough? How can I be fertile soil? All kinds of questions. If we focus on the soil, we could end up feeling guilty or determined to see how we could beat the odds of being poor souls for God's word. By focusing on the soils, we may try to cultivate our own lives and become better, even more fertile fields for God, which is not a bad thing to do. And sometimes... If we focus on the soil, there's a danger, you know, because it becomes about us and not about Christ. Folks, it's not about us. It's about Christ. But what if the parable isn't so much about the soil as it is about the seed and the sower? The gospel lesson begins with the sower as the subject of the parable. There was a sower. If the seed and the sower are the focus of the parable, what might that say about life and about call and about God? In this parable, as told by Luke, Jesus clarifies that the seed is the word of God. 
in terms of ministry, of the lives of those being called by God, this is a pretty important thing to know. The seed is the word of God. It's important to know because this is the good treasure that's been entrusted to us, to those who have been called. It is important because the word of God is the only thing that has the power to change the human heart. Amen. Preaching won't do it. Preaching alone won't do it. We cannot talk somebody into a new heart. <laughs> Programs won't do it. The American church tends to be programmed up to its ears. Programs for all kinds of things. Busy, 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 busy. Busy doing our programs, very busy, aren't we? But it's possible to mistake busyness for godliness and activity for spirituality. And the church should not be about programs. It should be about ministry. The only thing that produces lasting growth is the word of God. Preaching and programs without this word may produce quick growth, but it won't last. We need to get back to basics, folks. We need word-centered ministry. What are you sowing? You know... Good ministry produces different and unpredictable results in its hearers. I think this is the central teaching of this parable. Remember, there is nothing wrong with the seed. Nothing wrong with the seed. The same seed that the birds eat is the same seed that produces a good crop. And it's the same seed that produces a plant that withers away or gets choked by thorns. Good ministry cannot be defined solely in terms of visible or statistical results. A pastor can see huge results in one church and then struggle for years in another church. You can't know in advance how your ministry will be received Past success may be a good indicator, but it's not a guarantee. That's why Jesus told this story. For those of us who have heard God's call in our lives, and by the way, I'm not just talking about pastors here. All of us who have said yes, all of us who have said, yes, Lord, I believe have been commissioned to go and share and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Our job is to sow the seed. But as we sow, we need to be realistic so as to not become discouraged. And remember, it's not about us. Some seed will fall on the hard path, some on stony ground, some on thorny soil, and some will fall on good soil. But you can't know in advance where all the seeds will fall. So just sow. Just sow the good word. Sow the good word. Sow it. Don't be like Larry that Rich talked about yesterday. <laughs> Show up and sow the word. You can't know in advance where all the seeds will fall, but none of it will grow unless you show up and sow. Don't be misled by early success. You know, often when we enter a new ministry, there's a sudden growth spurt. 
when a pastor comes to a new church, there's generally a quick rise in attendance, followed by a plateau, followed by a period of much smaller growth. A new pastor, they bring excitement, they bring a fresh perspective, new ideas, it's an infusion of energy. It's not unusual for people to come to church to check out the new girl or guy. <laughs> it's easy for a pastor to be misled by an initial jump in attendance or, uh, or participation she or he can start to think, hey, this is easy. <laughs> the ministry may be many things, folks, but it's not easy. Don't be misled by early success and become lax in our sowing efforts. Allow others to show up and think, we don't need to, like Larry. Don't be misled by early success and become lax in your sowing efforts. Think of it this way. Three of the four soils responded positively at first, but only one produced lasting fruit. The more of God's word you sow, the more likely you are to cast the seed on soil that produces lasting fruit. New beginnings, they can be difficult, but don't despair. Three of the four soils fail to produce good fruit. The sower flings his seed around rather wastefully, flings it all over the place in the typical method of sowing for the peasant farmer who scratched out a living from the dry and rocky Palestinian soil. In order to produce a harvest, a lot of seed had to be scattered. A lot of the seed had to be recklessly tossed, or should I say graciously wasted, on good and bad soil. In the parable, 75% of the seed was wasted in order to produce an adequate harvest. In that case, the odds of failure with that kind of sowing are three to one. But isn't that a lot like real life? In real life, there seems like it seems like there are more failures sometimes than successes, more waste than growth. Is Jesus suggesting that 75% of our efforts will go for naught? No. But folks, sometimes it can seem that way. Good soil can be hard to find. It can be hidden and not easily seen. In fact, bad soil can be developed into good soil, and we need to think about that because today the soil that we start out with has never been turned or tilled by Sunday school classes or regular attendance in any kind of religious education. Good soil can be developed. Any farmer knows that. But it has to be tilled sometimes over and over. Sometimes the field has to lie fallow for a period of time in order for it to become fertile once again. Good soil can be developed, but that takes time and effort. But when that soil is transformed, it can produce amazing results. Some people will be 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold in what they produce for the kingdom. You know, God can do a lot with a little. God can do a lot with just, what is it, Rich, a little wattage. God can do a lot. That's encouraging news. A few seeds sown in all kinds of soil can ultimately revolutionize a church. 
A few seeds sown in all kinds of soil can ultimately revolutionize a town and a family and a neighborhood, or when God wills it, an entire region. So where and how are you sowing? Your initial judgment of people will often be wrong. <laughs> you can't judge a book by its cover. You can't tell by looking what kind of heart a person has. That is, you can't infallibly know who will respond to the ministry of the word and produce good fruit as the seed is sown in many places, it will find a place in many hearts. You simply cannot tell in advance how people will respond over the long haul. Some people you knew would make good followers will fall away or will be tripped up by the cares of the world. And sometimes the unlikeliest of people will become mature believers. So don't make judgments on where you sow God's seed. Just sow it. Sow it. But make sure the seed you sow is God's seed and not something else. Show up and sow widely. The farmer, through handfuls in every direction, he knows that a certain amount of the seed will fall on the beaten path where it cannot take root. What the farmer doesn't know and can't know is where the stones and thorns are just under the surface or where the birds or the animals might carry and drop the seed somewhere else. The sower doesn't know where the good soil is that produces lasting fruit. So it's best to sow as widely as possible. The same is true in ministry. The best way to reach more people is to sow the word of God in as many ways possible, using every avenue that is open to you, reaching out to every age and every interest and every group that you can find, and support ways and even try ways of sowing the seed that you've never tried before. When you find good soil, cultivate it. Cultivate it. It's easy for a pastor and church leaders to be sidetracked into a thousand things that don't really matter much in the ministry. That's generally a recipe for burnout. No one and no church can do it all. And when we try to do it all, it's like taking a piece of bread and peanut butter and trying to spread that peanut butter just as thin as we can across that bread and put another piece on top of it, and then it becomes rather tasteless and unsatisfying. We cannot do it all by ourselves individually or as a single church. When you find good soil, cultivate it. That's what Jesus did. Though he spoke to the masses and though he had time for individuals, he gave the majority of his time to training the 12. He found them, discovered them, called them, trained them, developed them. He allowed them to come alongside and be with him up close and personal. He poured himself into that small group knowing that after his departure, listen to this, leaders in the itinerant ministry, knowing that after his departure, they would become the leaders of the movement that he had started. He deployed them. 
He deployed them so that they could continue in the ministry and mission of Jesus Christ. It's not about us. It's about the ministry and mission of Christ. Don't miss the point here. I don't think we can improve on Jesus' plan for reaching the world. Jesus indeed sowed God's seed widely. He preached to the masses. He ministered to individuals. He poured himself into a group of small, a small group of key followers who would then go on to multiply the way. There's only one thing wrong with this plan. One thing. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes showing up and putting effort into it. You have to be really committed to it. You have to be committed to the process. You have to Make the process of sowing a priority in your life. The best ministry is always life on life, one on one. A passion for God is better caught than taught. When you find the good soil, cultivate it. Work with the key leaders. Be a Barnabas kind of encourager so that eventually there will be a multiplied harvest for the Lord. Where... And in whom are you sowing? If we focus on the soil in Jesus' parable, things do look pretty grim for us. Consider our society. It seems to be bad soil. In many places, our society seems to be bad soil. It produces more problems than solution. We have racism and sexism and classism and consumerism and violence, and these things choke the life out of our community. Productivity has a slim chance. The odds seem to be against us. But before things start to look too hopeless, let us turn our attention Back to the sower. The sower pays little attention to the condition of the soil. <laughs> the sower pays little attention to the pathway. He seems to ignore the weeds and the thorns. He seems to ignore the hungry birds. He doesn't seem to worry about the odds of failure or success. The sower simply tosses the seeds everywhere, on good soil and bad soil alike. He appears to be oblivious to the types of soil on which the seed lands. And the sower isn't stingy with the seed, with wild abandon. He throws handfuls of seed generously, recklessly, extravagantly. God is the sower. God is reckless with goodness and wondrously extravagant with grace. God tosses the life-giving word upon the fields of our lives, landing on saint and sinner alike. God wildly sows the seeds of the kingdom without an eye to the nature of the soil. God is reckless and extravagant and graciously wasteful with good news, scattering it upon productive and unproductive soil. And odds are God can turn the odds around. God isn't worried about success or failure. God sows the seeds knowing that even though the patches of good earth may be small, the harvest will be plentiful. The sowing will bear fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. God is now calling us to do the sowing, to be a part of this creative process of multiplication we do the sowing, the seed must do the work. But it needs a receptive heart to bring forth fruit. What does a sower do with unproductive soil? 
he or she plows it up, throws out the rocks, pulls up the weeds, waters the ground, and plants it again. And God farms the human heart that, like that too. The sower cannot all by him or herself transform, transform rocky soil into good soil. The hillsides of Galilee are more rocks than soil. You could never get rid of the rocks, but God can and God will. And this is why the final word in ministry belongs to God and not to us. After all, we were once all like the seed sown on the path. But God, in God's mercy, intervened. God, through Christ, did for us what we could never do for ourselves, gave us a brand new beginning and a brand new heart. If God can do that for us, God can do that for anyone. With God, all things are possible. This is why we keep on sowing, keep on watering, keep on praying, and keep on waiting. We believe that God can do things that are far beyond our expectations. God has done it before. God will do it again. And God is doing it at this moment, here and now, and all over the world. This parable teaches patience and hope and generosity we need patience because some of the seeds we sow will never produce the fruit for which we hope, but others will produce 100 times more than we ever expected. And this is why we preach and pray and keep on sowing the word. There is good soil out there, even though it's not always obvious or easy to find. So where are you sowing? Whether you know it or not, you're sowing something. People are receiving something. So the important question is not only where are you sowing, but what are you sowing? My hope and prayer is that you are sowing God's word, the seed, the good treasure entrusted to us. It is by sowing God's word generously and extravagantly that indeed we can stand up and show the world who we are. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. So, so extravagantly, so always and everywhere, so, and there will be a glorious harvest in God. God's time, by God's grace, and for God's glory. Amen. Amen.